Stanford University. No physical device ever measures what it's intended, uh, the mathematical thing that it's intended to measure. At best, what's usually true is a thing measures what it's supposed to measure over a limited range of whatever it happens to be. Uh, a spring, uh, what, do you, what do you call those, a spring balance. You know, just a spring with a calibrated uh, measure along it. You use it to measure force. You want to pull on something, and so you connect your spring balance to it, and you pull on it, and you look at the calibration, and you say, okay, the, um, the number of ticks, or not the number of ticks, but the length of the stretch of the spring is a measure of the force. Well, that's not really true. If you, um, if you pull too hard, you break the spring, and so forth. So over some limited range of force, the spring, the length of the spring constant, the length of the spring displacement measures the force. So normally what the situation is, is you have some quantity which you can measure in the laboratory easily. It could be the length of the stretched spring, or it could be the height of uh, the uh, mercury in a, in a thermometer. And you ask yourself, what could the um, the quantity in question, what could it depend on? All right, the length of the spring displacement clearly depends on, depends on, doesn't mean it's equal to, it depends on the force that's being applied, but it could depend on other things. It could depend on the temperature, it could depend on the air pressure, but gee, that's not terribly important. Those variations are pretty small, so you ignore them. And you say, what could it depend on? It can depend on the force that's pulling the spring. There's going to be some relationship between them. I don't know, it might look like that, who knows? Some, uh, some crazy curve. And then over some limited range, over some limited range where the function is linear, and if the function is smooth, any function that's smooth, that doesn't vary in some crazy way, over a, lim over a limited range will be linear. If it's linear, then you can say over that limited range, variations in the quantity that you're measuring are proportional to variations in the, uh, uh, in whatever the independent variable happens to be. In the case of the spring balance, it's just force. Same thing with the Mercury in a, uh, in a column here. What can the height of the column depend on? Well, yeah, it can depend on, on temperature. What else can it depend on? Can it depend on the air pressure in the room? Not much, because the air pressure in the room is uh, it's, it's isolated uh, by, the, um, by the closed, uh, right, by the uh, um, by the glass that holds the mercury in. What else can it depend on? I can't think of anything. Can you think of anything it might depend on besides the temperature in there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe the, yeah, sure, the local gravity field. Yes, right. Uh, okay, so let me say it a different way. It could depend on the, on the direction that you hold the, uh, the thermometer. Now the, now, the local gravity field is pretty constant over the surface of the Earth. The only, you could, you could have a funny thermometer, a bad, not necessarily a bad thermometer, but a thermometer which behaved differently if you held it horizontally than if you held it vertically. And then you would just say, okay, my rule is going to be hold the thermometer vertically. If it depends very much, then you just, then you just say, okay, let's fix the direction of the thermometer make it part of the definition of the thermometer. It will hold the thermometer vertically. Anything else anybody can think of that? Uh, that Over time, it could change calibration because of maybe chemical 
Mm. Mercury and glass are pretty inert. So we're in pretty good shape for that. What else might it? Of course, over very long times, you're right. I mean, the protons that make up the, um, the mercury could uh, decay over long enough times, 10 to 34, 10 to 35 years. All right, but you think about it for a while, and you say, gee, to a very, very high approximation, the only thing that the height of the column is going to depend on is going to be the, uh, the, um, the temperature, or equivalently, the energy of uh, the, uh, the, the energy that the, uh, that the mercury has absorbed from the thermal uh, environment that it's in. But that's equivalent. Okay? If that, it, assuming, assuming that the thermometer is in equilibrium with the environment. Of course, if the thermometer is not in equilibrium in the, with the environment, it is not measuring the temperature of the environment. It's only if there's been time established for the environment to come to equilibrium with the mercury. And then the only thing around is the temperature. So the height of the column depends on the temperature in some way. Let's suppose uh, this point over here, we've measured it. We find out over some range, over some range that it looks pretty linear. A small range, not a big range. Big range, it's going to go through the, you know, it's going to do also. If you make the temperature very hot, the, co the column gets bigger if you make it hot, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not going to go through the, through the ceiling here. So over some range, it looks pretty linear. Let's say you measure it at the freezing point of water. And uh, at the freezing point of water, this is temperature. This is the height of the uh, column. And you find it's over here. Then you measure it at boiling water. You find it's over here. If you uh, are lucky, over that particular range, this function will look pretty linear. And so you divide it into 100 little segments. And you say each segment constitutes a, uh, you, you arbitrarily say, this point you call 0. That's on the, ten, uh, on the centigrade scale. This point you call 100, and you divide it into 100 steps. Is it a thermometer measuring temperature? Yeah, the thermometer is measuring temperature to a high accuracy. Um, but First of all, it's not measuring temperature in the absolute sense. We've called this temperature zero. So it's not measuring absolute temperature, the thermometer. When you, when you go out in the wintertime and it says zero degrees on your Fahrenheit thermometer, it doesn't mean you're going out into absolute zero. So there's a convention about where you put the zero. But small incremental changes in the temperature will be proportional to small incremental changes in the height of the column. Yeah. What about equilibrium? That's kind of what I was wondering, the time scale over which you can achieve equilibrium. Are we really talking about sort of a boundary layer around the bulb of the thermometer? Are you asking how long it takes to establish thermal equilibrium? Mm. Depends on the thermal conductivity of the glass here. If, th if it's too good an insulator, it will take too much time for the heat to pass, uh, for the energy to pass between the mercury and the environment. But the answer is pretty simple. Experimentally, when the thermometer stops changing, that's when it's in equilibrium. So how long does it take if you change the temperature from 0 to 100 degrees or something like that, how long does it take the thermometer to, uh, to equilibrate? The answer is how much, what, uh, half a minute. Depends on the thermometer. But experimentally, the answer is when the thermometer stops changing, it's in equilibrium with the environment.
but technically you're taking the temperature of the medium immediately surrounding the thermometer, assuming it's in equilibrium and uniform. And that's that's mm -hmm. an assumption. You know, it also depends on the environment. You can have a high temperature and have very, very few molecules. If the density is very low, but the temperature is high, and there's no reason why that can't happen. It just means the kinetic energy of the molecules is high. Kinetic energy of the molecules is high means the temperature is high. But there may be very few molecules in the room. You bring the thermometer into the room, it's not going to equilibrate very rapidly because very, very few molecules are going to hit it. So depending on the density of the material, the equilibration time could be very long or it could be a lot shorter. If you were to thin out the air in the room so that the, uh, so that the air density was, let's say, 1 one-hundredth or 1 one-thousandth of the air density in the room here today, but you would keep the temperature the same, the thermometer would take a longer time to equilibrate. But nevertheless, experimentally, the rule would be it's equilibrated when it stops changing. You could also have a difference between the radiation temperature and the air temperature. Yes. But that means the air temperature, the air and the radiation are not in equilibrium. Right. Uh, it's rather hard to bring radiation in a room into thermal equilibrium with the air. The air doesn't radiate, the air molecules are neutral, they don't radiate much. Uh, I assure you, in this room here, the radiation in the room, optical radiation, is, is no way, nowhere is near being in equilibrium with the air. Uh, on the other hand, there's very, very few photons in this room compared with the, uh, with the um, air molecules, and so they really don't count very much. Okay. Yeah. When does the ideal gas break down under what conditions? Mm -hmm. Can we show mathematically? Mm -hmm. Well, since you happen to ask, why don't I just off the top of my head do a calculation of how the ideal gas law breaks down when there are forces between molecules? Just purely off the top of my head, I'm going to throw away my lecture notes. Just because I'm looking at them and staring at them, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not using them. OK, a gas of weakly interacting particles. Now, why weakly interacting? Well, we've done the problem of the non-interacting gas molecules. Okay. We only want to make, I, well, it's easy to make a little step. Little steps are usually easy. Where you change problems, known solved problems, it's often easy to change the problem a little bit, numerically, to change some parameters just a little bit, and then try to expand in the small changes. That's the usual trick. You have some problem that you solve for some quantity epsilon equal to zero, epsilon being some small number. Then you reformulate the problem with epsilon not being zero, and it's too hard to solve. But if you're lucky, you might be able to expand in a power series in epsilon and then check whether the succeeding orders are as big as the thing you started with. How do you tell when a, when a, when a, series, break, a series like that they, uh, uh, breaks down? Or a, um, you tell when it breaks down when the second term is as big as the first term. Right. So we're going to do that problem today. We're going to do the problem of a weakly interacting gas. And of course, uh, it's weakly interacting because it's dilute. Because the molecules are on the average rather far from each other. We'll assume the range of the forces 
is small by comparison with the distance between the particles, we'll assume that the potential energy between particles, or the forces, are small. We'll do our calculation, and then we'll look at the result, and we'll say, where does this break down? Where does the correction term become as large as the uncorrected term? And we'll check. We'll find out. Okay? It's going to depend on the density. The bigger the density, the more likely molecules are going to crash into each other. And if they crash into each other, they're going to experience the fact that they're interacting. If you make the density too high, they're all jumbled in, squeezed on top of each other. And the ideal gas is a very bad approximation. Uh, on the other hand, you could keep the density low. But if the range of the force is long, if particles were to interact with each other strongly, when they were six feet apart, the molecules in this room, even if, the, even if the interaction was pretty weak, that would still be a very, very serious modification of the uh, ideal gas law. And so we, want to, we, we start by assuming that we can make an expansion in a small parameter. We make the expansion, mathematically expand, and then check whether the corrections to the first term are big or small as big or smaller, bigger, smaller than the, than the term that they're correcting. OK, so let's, uh, let's uh, set up that problem. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate the partition function for a system of molecules for which the energy is not just the sum of the kinetic energies where there are forces. Forces means a potential energy. So let's start with a formula. The formula is that the energy of a set of molecules is the sum of all the molecules. Sum of all of them. N stands for which molecule we're talking about. P squared. Now, P stands for the sums of the squares of the components of the momentum. P squared over twice the mass. That's the usual kinetic energy of a, of a molecule. Plus, now we're going to assume that every molecule experiences a force from a, every other molecule. That means that there's a potential energy for each pair of molecules. And the total potential energy is the sum over all the pairs of molecules, sums over pairs. Not sums over pairs like apples and pears, but sums over pairs of molecules. OK, so how do we write a sum over pairs? We say a sum over n and m, but n and m label two particles, the fifth particle and the 192nd. But we don't want to count twice. We don't want to count n equals 3 and m equals 7 and also n equals 7 and m equals 3. That's the same pair. We also don't want to count as a pair m and m. We don't want to think that uh, the first molecule and the first molecule forms a pair. So we can do this by saying we only sum for n bigger than m. Do you want to have something other than m, since we've already got an m? <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right, sum n greater than m, that means you count 3 and 2, but you don't count 2 and 3. Right. You know what I mean. All right, and what is it going to be? It's going to be some potential energy u. Now, I'm not going to use v for potential energy because v was saving for volume. u of the distance between molecule n and molecule m. So let's write that as the distance between xn and xm. And this means xn minus xm means the vector separating the nth position from the mth, mth position. The absolute value means the distance itself. And the potential energy is a function of the distance between these two molecules. 
When we sum it over n greater than m, we add up all of the potential energy. So we can just call this thing here, let's just call it u, u of x. But here's what it is. All right, now, u is, it's, what is going to be the small quantity? The small quantity is going to be u. The potential energy is going to be assumed to be a good deal smaller than the kinetic energy between molecules. In other words, we start with the ideal gas, and then we simply turn a knob that turns on the potential, but we keep that knob very small so that at least at first, uh, the potential energy stored by these pairs of molecules is much smaller than the kinetic energy of either of them. That's our approximation. That's where we're going to begin. All right, uh, there's actually only one number regarding this potential which is important. I'm going to define it now. Question? We're going to encounter the following integral. It's going to be, let's take particle one and particle two. It doesn't matter which pair, just two particles, one and two. dx1, dx2. Now, what do I mean by dx1, first of all? Particle one has three coordinates, right? x, y, and z. When I write dx, I mean the integral over the volume element for particle one, the three-dimensional volume, and I mean for the, I mean the same thing here. If I just write dx, it means this kind of symbol here. And now I want to write the potential energy as a function of the distance between them, between them. What I'm doing is I'm taking the two particles and I'm integrating over all possible positions of the two particles the potential energy between them. Let's suppose for a moment that I hold the relative position, the relative position, x1 minus x2 fixed, and I integrate over the position of x1. That's moving x1 around, dragging x2 with it. How, how can I do the integral over two coordinates? One way is to integrate over one of the coordinates, keeping the separation to the other one fixed, and then afterwards integrate over the separation between them. Two separate uh, steps. And what do I get if I, hold, well, if I hold the distance between the two of these fixed, but integrate the position of the pair of them all over space? I'm going to get a factor of the volume. Right? Just holding the two of them fixed and thinking of them as a unit and integrating them all over space, I will get a factor of the volume of space. Right. Now, I've taken care of that integral. Let's hold this point fixed. I could have said it the other way. I could have said, let's hold this point fixed and integrate over the position of the second one. Yeah, let's think of it that way. Let's do it in the opposite order. Let's think of it by first holding particle one fixed and integrating over the position of the other particle. What does that give me? That gives me the integral d, let's call it x, any x, u of x. All it's doing is holding one particle fixed and moving the other particle around and adding up or integrating the total potential energy times the volume element of the particle it's moving around. Yeah, what are the units, before, what are the units of this quantity? What's the units of, uh, of u? Energy. What's the units of dx? Length, right? But this is really d3x. It's a volume integral. So what are the units of d3x? Volume. The units of this thing are volume times energy. This quantity is telling us how important the energy is because it's both telling us how strong the potential energy is, and how, over how big a volume does you act? How spread out is it? 
And let's give this thing a name. This thing is going to be our important numerical quantity that determines the strength of the potential. It's a combination of how strong the potential is and how widespread it's distributed. Let's just call this u0. It's the only parameter that will come into our calculation. And you don't know if it's big or small. If it's big, you don't know offhand whether it's big because it's distributed over a large volume, but u is small, or whether it's distributed over a small volume and u is big. One way or another, u0 is the thing which will determine everything else. All right, so now supposing we, we held this particle fixed and integrated over the other one, that would give us this integral here, and it would be u0. Now, having done that, let's integrate the position of this, of, of this molecule, which means move the pair around. That's going to give us another factor of volume, of the total volume of the gas times u0. Can everybody see that? that Make sure I understand. Uh, you, you're, that, that u naught integral, is that referring to a single pair of particles? Yeah, we pick out any pair of particles, any pair. Fix, are you keeping the other one at constant distance, or are you moving it all over? Yeah, well, no. We first, we first hold this one fixed and integrate the other one everywhere. Yeah, but of course, we're not going to get much except when this is in the field of the potential. You might ask, why doesn't holding this one fixed and integrating the other one, why don't we get a factor of volume for that? Because we're assuming, I should have said, we're assuming that whatever the function u is, that it's a function which goes to 0 when the particles get far apart. So whatever u is, it's a function which is only significant when the two particles are within a certain distance, let's say. Beyond that distance, it goes to 0. So if we hold one particle fixed and integrate the other one, well, if it were a one-dimensional problem, we would just say the integral would be the area under this curve. Well, it's not quite the area under the curve because it's a three-dimensional integral. It has units of energy times volume, not energy times length, energy times volume, but it is just the integral that you get if you held one of them fixed and integrated the other one all around it, so to speak. Having done that, we can now integrate the second particle, the one that we held fixed. And when we do that, it will just give us another factor of the overall volume of a system. It's not the same volume, right? Not the same, same volume as what? Well. In, in, in the u0, you only had the volume in the vicinity of... That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. This u0 is equal, let's say it's qualitatively equal, qualitatively equal to the height of the function, I don't know what to call it, I'll just call it u, times the volume over which the function is significant. This volume is roughly the volume of a couple of times the volume of a molecule, basically. All right? The forces between molecules, the potential energy between molecules, is only significant when the two molecules are within a couple of molecular di uh, diameters of each other. So this volume is roughly the volume of a couple of molecules. The other volume is the volume of the whole sample, of the whole um, box of gas. The small volume here is absorbed into u naught. We don't have to worry about it anymore. It's absorbed into u naught. u naught is a combination of the small molecular size volume times the strength of the potential energy between the molecules. And then we have to take into account the other integral, the other integral is the total volume of the system. Yes? Um, just to make sure I understand, u naught at least a, a priori is, it depends on the particle that's fixed. But what you're saying is because of It depends our on the distance between particles. We're assuming it depends on the distance between particles. If we right. move to... Yeah. One of them fixed, mm -hmm. and then you do this integral, mm -hmm. and so that result depends upon the point that you kept fixed. If you move to another fixed point, it might be different. No, 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 no. You're no. Not. No, right. I am saying it's not because 
it only depends on the distance between them. That's right. So if we hold, if we hold the molecule fixed over here and take the other one and integrate it all around it, we get a u-naught. If we put the first molecule over here and we integrate it around it, we get the same number. But it's, if you don't make this assumption about the nearness, it would seem to me if you took a particle that was very near the boundary, ah. you might get a different integral than one in the center. And it, so yeah. it's that assumption yeah. that you've got yeah. there that makes... Yeah, there are always, in all of this, there are always boundary effects. The boundary effects, and what we're always using is the fact that for a large volume, the volume is much bigger than the area. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a surface to volume ratio story. But you're perfectly right. This is not exactly true, just because when you take the molecule and you move it near the walls of the, uh, of the box, you made a little bit of a mistake by assuming that the other molecule can be anywhere around it. It can only be anywhere around it, but not uh, banging into the wall. So there's a little mistake there. The mistake is not important as long as the box is much bigger in volume than the volume here. In other words, if the box is much bigger than a, um, than a molecule, then the error made is, is very small, negligible. All right, so here we are. We have this integral, and we're going to save it because we're going to use it. But I just wanted to get it up there. For my comments. Question? Yes. Um, so the, the end result of this integral is the sum of the, the potential energies of all possible configurations of two particles? Is that basically yes. right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. That's exactly what it is. But it's only proportional to one volume and not two volumes for the reasons we said. Its units are the units of volume squared times energy, but it's only proportional to one volume uh, as of, you know what I mean. Yeah, question. Uh, yeah, uh, you said that the surface to volume uh, ratio has to be such that we can uh, ignore boundary effect. Is it reasonable to say that it's similar to a sphere? Because, uh, uh, you know, as you grow the volume, grow the surface, so the shape is what really matters. If it's a, the sphere has the smallest surface to volume. Uh, is that? It does, but if the sphere is big, it's still true that the surface to volume is very small. So um, the answer is, is doesn't depend on the shape of the object, except for these small surface area effects. Um, um, In thermodynamics in general and in statistical mechanics, we often ignore surface things. Surface things are sort of the exception. The molecule at the surface is, the, 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 let's just put it this way, the number of molecules which are within a molecular diameter of the surface is much, much smaller than the number of molecules which are further than a molecular di diameter from the, from the surface. So there's a small fraction. Fractionally speaking, the number of molecules for which we're making a mistake by, uh, by saying the potential energy only depends on the distance between them and ignoring the boundaries, the percentage of the system is very, very small. We could estimate it for a box, but we don't have to. We know that the uh, surface to volume is, uh, is very small. Of course, if we take the box small, at some point, we're going to start to experience the importance of the surface. But that's pretty small. Yeah. No, we're still not um, bringing in collisions yet. Not yet. Well, no, 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 of course we are. The existence of a potential energy, the derivative of a potential energy is a force, and a force creates collisions. We don't, we're not going to ever have to think about collisions we're never going to have to think about following the particles. Um, we don't have to think about it, you see. This is the beauty of statistical mechanics. You lose all intuition about what's really going on, but you have a set of mechanical rules. You go on to autopilot, you follow the rules, and you get the answers in a completely rigorous way and you don't have to worry about whether some assumptions that you may have made 
such as whether the particles have the same average velocity if they're near the walls or not near the walls, or if they're near each other and not near each other. You don't have to worry about that. So um, it's always good to go back and say, you know, what really are we doing? And are we getting an answer that we would have expected from, uh, from naive thinking? But if we want to really know whether we have the right answer, best to set out the rules, get onto autopilot, follow the equations, and at the end, look at it and say, does this make sense? Yeah. Uh, so we're basing this on uh, looking at pairs of particles. Are we losing anything by not looking at triples and higher combinations? Mm -hmm. First of all, there could be terms in the energy which depend on three particles at a time. The energy between two particles conceivably could depend on the presence of a nearby third particle. So we have made an assumption when we've written that the energy can be written as a sum of pairs. Now, the point is, why is it a good approximation, first of all, to use the ideal gas? And the answer is, it's a good approximation when the probability of the particles being close enough, to feel, clo close enough together to feel each other is small. So when the gases dilute, the particles spend most of the time being far enough away that they simply don't feel each other. Some fraction of the time, two particles will get close enough together to feel, to be within this, uh, this little volume distance. And that's when the forces between those two molecules become important. Now, what's the fraction of the time that three given molecules will be within the molecular distance of each other? Much, much smaller. The probability that three, take three and ask what's the probability that all three of them will be within a molecular diameter of each other is vastly smaller, depending on the volume of the gas, of course, is much smaller than the probability that two of them will be near each other. So if there were three body forces, the three body forces would be less important, not because they're weaker, but because just on the average, the probability of finding three particles in the neighborhood of each other for a dilute gas is, is even smaller. All right, the three body forces. There are also, we're going to do an expansion. And the expansion, uh, there are three body effects, even if the forces are only two body effects. But you're in, the answer to your question is we're going to follow the expansion and see what we find. There are other terms. They won't be important as long as the particles are dilute. Dilute. OK, so where do we go? Let now, now we get on autopilot. What do we want to calculate? We want to calculate the partition function. Z. An integral, let's remember. You integrate over the momentums, the momenta. You integrate over the position. Now, dp and dx really stand for a very high dimensional multiple integral. How high is the dimension of the integral? Each one of them, three times the number of particles. You have dx, the three components of momentum for the first particle, the three components for the second particle, and so forth. 3n, and I'm not going to bother writing it that this is a multiple integral of power 3n. Likewise, dx is a big multiple integral. We'll just write it this way. There's this factor of n factorial that makes no difference at all that we sometimes put in. Makes no difference at all. And then we have e to the minus. e to the minus what? e to the minus beta. Beta is the inverse temperature times the energy of the whole system. And the energy of the whole system is a term which is kinetic energy. I'm just going to write it as p squared over 2m. OK? 
capital M. It stands for the sum here. I could put the summation sign in, but it's, this, is, this is close enough. Right. That's one term. And then the other term is the potential energy. So it's going to be an exponential of the sum of two things. And the exponential of the sum of two things is just the product of two exponentials. E to the minus beta times, let's just call it u of x. And this stands, u of x here stands for the total potential energy as a function of all of the positions. And this is our job to try to compute. Now, the glorious and simplifying feature of this is that it factorizes. It factorizes into a momentum integral and a position integral, with the integrand itself being a product. So in fact, we can write it as the product of two integrals. The first integral we've in fact seen before. I won't bother to remind, I, I, I will actually tell you what it is, just, uh, just, uh, just to remind you. We're not going to need it, but the first integral, the momentum integral, was, um, now I've forgotten what it was, a uh, square root of, uh, there's a 2 in there, there's a pi, and there's an m over beta, is that right? Do you remember that? Raised to the power 3n over, no, uh, 3, yeah, 3n, do you remember that? It was this Gaussian integral for each momentum, and it's what we used. It's exactly the integral that we did for the case of the ideal gas. If u was 0, we would be doing the ideal gas. But we'd have exactly the same integral here. We're not going to need it. Fortunately, we're not going to need it. But one of the integrals is exactly the one that we did the last time. Now, the previous time, when we did the integral over position, before we had any potential energy, do you remember what this integral over position gave us? It gave us the volume raised to the nth power. That's when this was just when u was 0. If u was 0, it's just the integral dx, just the volume to the nth power. Everybody remember that? OK. So let's actually multiply and divide by the volume to the nth power. Let's put in here volume to the nth power and then divide by volume to the nth power. And the reason for doing that is because then we immediately recognize this integral as the old partition function for the ideal gas. This integral here is just the partition function for the ideal gas. So we can call it z0. Zero. zero now stands for the calculation when u is equal to 0, when there are no forces between the, the ideal gas. That's the partition function as a function of beta, it depends on beta, of the ideal gas. The other factor is the new thing here. So this is the factor we have to work on. Let's take it over to this blackboard and work on it. And of course, I'm not telling you anything you wouldn't have done yourself if you would have spent 15 minutes with it. You would have realized very quickly that the integral factorizes. One of the factors, if we put in the v to the n, would have been just the partition function of the ideal gas. And the other factor is the new thing that we want to calculate. Okay, so here it is. Integral dx over volume to the n e to the minus beta of the potential energy. Now, what's the small quantity in our calculation that we're going to expand in terms of? U. The potential energy is the thing which is being assumed to be small. We're starting with an ideal gas, and then we turn our little knob that turns on the potential energy, and we turn it on very, very weakly. 
If we turn it on very weakly, we can expand this exponential in a Taylor series in the strength of u. But it's very easy. It's just equal to 1 minus beta u of x. Those are the first two terms. Uh, what I'm using is that e to the minus something, let's call it s, is equal to 1 minus s plus s squared over 2 factorial, blah, 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 blah. But when s is very small, of course, when s is sufficiently small, we ignore everything but the 1. But we're interested in keeping track of the correction. The s squared will be much smaller than s if s is small. So let's keep the first correction. That's 1 minus beta u of x. All right, so let's plug that in. Let's get rid of the exponential and replace it by 1 minus beta u of x. What does the integral over 1 give us? Can anybody guess what the integral of the first, the first integral is? v to the n, right? v to the n divided by v to the n, that's 1. I thought a question. By uh, that 1 there means that you assume potential at 0 is 0. Right? No. No, I have not. I've just said the first term here is just 1. And the integral over dx is just v to the n. Right. So the first integral is just the number 1, v to the n over v to the n. Right. Then minus beta times the integral dx over v to the n u of x. I think I have everything. Yes. So let's see if we can do this integral here. It looks terrible. U is some terrible sum. But that's OK, because this, the integral of a sum is just the sum of the integrals. And it's just the integrals of sum of integrals for pairs of particles. Every pair of particles gives exactly the same answer as every other pair of particles. So up in here, we have the sum for n greater than m, doesn't matter, n greater than m or m greater than n, u of the distance between them of. OK, this is a sum of integrals. Let's focus on one. And every one of them gives exactly the same answer as every other one, because every pair of particles is, uh, there's nothing distinguished about particle 2s and particle 7 relative for particle 50 and particle 494. You have the same answer. And in fact, they will give exactly the same answer as particle 1 and particle 2. Just no sum, just particle 2 and particle 1. But how many such terms do I have? How many such pairs are there? Which is what? N times n over, two. over 2. n times n minus 1 over 2. So we can just do this as dx1, dx2, and then dx is all the other dx's, all the other ones. How many of them are there? How many x's here? 3 and no, we've already we got two of them here. So it's n minus 2. Well, yeah, 3 times n minus 2, but n minus 2. All right. Um, good. What's the next step? The next step is exactly that, to say, um, ah, there's a factor of n times n minus 1 over 2. It was just explained to us. That's n choose 2 minus beta times n times n minus 1 divided by 2. That, once we put that factor there, we don't have to sum anymore over the various particles. We just take particle 1 and particle 2. Nothing special about 1 and 2. Is it n minus 1 or n plus 1? 
Yeah. N times N minus 1. N minus one. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused about why x2 minus x, u of x2 minus x1 has the same value for every pair of particles. No. No, no, no. It doesn't. There are, there are many integrals here. It's a sum of integrals, but every integral has exactly the same form. All right. Has exactly the same form. Each integral is an integral where two of the x's are inside a u, and all the other ones are not inside a u. You want me to write the whole thing out? <coughs> we'll write it. Okay, well, so we're not, we're not assuming that, that, that there's usable. That's the first term. The second term is exactly the same, except wherever I see 1 and 2, I put 2 and 3, or 2 and 7. Exactly the same here, and still, it's not right. Each one of these integrals is the same, and there are n times n minus 1 over 2 of them, and so I just leave it that way. OK, what about these integrals over here? What do they give me? The ones that, uh, that aren't in u here. Each one gives me a volume. So there's a factor of volume to how many powers? n minus 2, right? Now, what about this integral over u? We erased it. Integral dx1 dx2 of u of x1 minus x2 is equal to the volume times u0. That was the definition of u0. So when I do that integral, I wish I were taller, but I'm not. Can you remember this? Never mind. Okay. That's exactly the integral that we have here. So let's replace it by that. It's 1 minus beta. Now, n times n minus 1 over 2, we can approximate that by n squared. Are we making a mistake? Yes, we are, but we're making a mistake very small compared to the piece we keep. We could keep the uh, n times n minus 1, but uh, let's just approximate it by n squared. We've done worse things than that when we did uh, Sterling's formula. N times N minus 1, you know, 1,000 times 1,000 is a million minus 1,000. Well, you know, that's close enough to a million. Divided by a 2. That's good. Now we have V to the N minus 2 over V to the N. That's um, 1 over V squared. Sorry. One, yeah, 1 over V squared, right? And then we have this integral. This integral gives us another power of volume up upstairs, so it becomes a volume, times u0. So now we have the partition function. The partition function is equal to the partition function of the free gas without interactions times this factor, which is 1 minus beta n squared over 2 divided by the volume times u0. What do we want to do with this? Well, again, we go on autopilot. Everybody knows that what you do with a partition function is you take its logarithm. All the interesting formulas are about logarithms of the partition function. So let's take its logarithm next. Oops, no, times. This is times. This is z equals. So log of z will, first of all, equal log of the original partition function for the ideal gas. We're never even going to really need it, because we're really just considering the corrections, plus 
logarithm of 1 minus beta n squared over 2v times u naught. What are we expanding in? We're expanding in the magnitude of u, of u naught to be precise. u naught is our expansion parameter. We're trying to make a Taylor series expansion, or an expansion in powers of u naught. Well, here we have the logarithm of 1 minus a constant times u naught. What is our goal? Our goal is to expand it in powers of u naught. So what is the Taylor series expansion of log of 1 minus, let's call it 1 minus x, log of 1 minus x for small x? Anybody know what that is? <coughs> minus, minus x. Minus x. Minus x. Log of 1 is 0, right? So that doesn't give us anything. And if we Taylor series expand log of 1 minus x, this is an exercise. You know how to do a Taylor series expansion. You would differentiate. So it's already on the upper board, e to the minus s. What's that? The Taylor expansion is already on the upper board, e to the minus s. Yeah, it is. So this is just equal to minus x. Log of 1 minus x is equal to minus x. If I wanted to write it all out, I could write the whole thing out. Minus x, I think it's a plus x squared over 2 minus, I think, x cubed over 3 plus x to the 4 over 4. Not factorial, just uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. But we're not interested in things which are quadratic when u is small. So it's just 1 minus, it's just minus x. So what does that do? When Taylor series expanded, we don't even have to write the log anymore. And we don't have to have the 1 here. It's just log of z0 minus, I think it's minus, I hope it's minus. Is it plus? It's, minus? it's minus, I think. Minus beta n squared over twice the volume times the u naught. Now, is this what we want? No, we're never really interested in the log of the partition function. We're interested in what you can get from it. All right. So pick something interesting to get that you can get from the, partition, from the log of the partition function. Energy. Let's calculate the energy of the gas. That's equal to minus the derivative of the partition function, or minus the derivative of the log of the partition function with respect to what? Remember? Beta. Beta. All right, we're going to get the first term over here. That's just going to be the original expression that we had for the, um, for the ideal gas. I don't have to calculate it again. I know what happens if I differentiate log 0 with respect to log z0 with respect to beta, I get the energy of the ideal gas at temperature beta. So what's the first term? The number of molecules times 3 halves times the temperature, 3 halves n times t. That's the first term from here. That's just the good old. Um, Boltzmann, Maxwell Boltzmann, whoever it was, who realized that, uh, that in thermal equilibrium at temperature T, each, each particle has energy 3 halves T. So that's the first term. The second term, we want to differentiate with respect to beta. We have to, we have to change. There's a minus sign. That'll kill this minus sign here, and we'll get a plus. Differentiating this with respect to beta just gives us n squared over 2v times u naught. Now, of course, we always expect in a situation like this that the total energy should be proportional to the number of particles. This term here is proportional to the number of particles. This term here is weird. It's, it's quadratic in the number of particles, proportional to the square of the number of particles. That's crazy. 
If I have 10 to the 23rd particles, I get an energy of uh, 10 to the 46. I don't care what units you use, 10 to the 46 is too big. But that's all right, because the volume is also big. So let's factor out an n. Let's factor out an n. And now what is n over v? <coughs> The density. And the density is whatever it is. It's neither big nor small. Well, it may be small because we're talking about a dilute gas. But here's our formula for the energy. A term which doesn't depend on the density at all. Of course, it does depend on the density. It depends on the number of particles. Depends on the number of particles, but only the number of particles, and is proportional to the number of particles. And here's another term that's proportional to the number of particles. It depends on the potential energy between particles. But it also depends explicitly on the density. Why does it depend on a factor of the density? Yeah. Because it's an energy per particle, but there shouldn't really be an energy per particle. There should be an energy per particle only if there's another particle nearby. So if we focused on one particle and we said, what's the probability that there's another particle nearby, it would be proportional to the density. The higher the density, the more probable it is that there's a neighboring particle. So the correction term here. It's also contained in the fact that there's an n squared here. n squared is the number of pairs of particles, roughly. So it's n, one part, for each particle, there's an energy, but the energy is proportional to the density of particles. And as I said, that's because each particle, if the density was very small, you might have a particle OK, but the chances that there was another particle nearby would be negligible. As the density increases, the chances that that particle is near a second one start to increase. And so there's a factor of the density here. OK, so we could express this in terms of an of a energy per particle. The energy per particle has a first term, which is just proportional to the temperature. It doesn't, have, it doesn't care how many other particles are nearby. And the second term is proportional to the potential energy between pairs of particles times another factor of the density. And that, uh, of course, this can be confirmed for a, uh, this, in, it, it, one doesn't easily measure the energy of a gas. So this is not the way to confirm it. What's an interesting thing that you can, uh, that you can measure that, uh, that uh, is easy to measure? Temperature. Well, the temperature is an input. The temperature is input here. Oh, notice this term doesn't depend on the temperature. Interesting fact, doesn't depend on the temperature. OK, what's another thing that you can measure uh, about a gas? The pressure. The pressure. Easy to measure pressure. So. The question is, what does this say about the pressure? So let's calculate the pressure. We have everything we need. This is log z. This is log z. And let me remind you what the formula for the pressure is. We wrote it in terms of the Helmholtz free energy, but that's, uh, that's a funny way to write it. We can, sorry, we can write it that way. There was this quantity, which was A, which was minus T log Z. And the formula, I'll just remind you, the formula for the pressure was the derivative of A with respect to volume minus sign at fixed temperature. That was the formula we worked out last time. The pressure is the derivative of A or just minus or become plus temperature times the derivative of the log of z with respect to volume at fixed temperature.
This was the formula we worked out last time for the pressure. So now all we have to do is apply it. There are two terms. When we differentiate log z, we're going to get a term from here. What's that going to be? That's the pressure of the ideal gas. All right, so we first get the pressure of the ideal gas, PV equals NT. Remember that, PV equals NT. So P equals PV equals NT, NT divided by V, right? That's the pressure of the ideal gas. N over V is rho. So the first term is the density, time, the density of particles times the temperature. That's exactly what we had last time from differentiating log z naught. Now, what about this term here? Let's differentiate that. But first, we have to multiply it by temperature. All right. So let's multiply this by temperature. If we multiply this by temperature, then the correction term, let's go the correction term here, multiply by temperature by T. And what is T times beta? One. So by the time we have finished multiplying by temperature, this just becomes minus N squared over 2V times U naught with a minus sign. But we actually want minus T times log Z. Oh, the, t the minus signs are flying all over the place. And it's only a question of whether there's an odd or an even number of them, right? I will tell you that there's, uh, the number is such that the answer is, we want to differentiate, let's see what we do. We want to differentiate this with the, the, just minus signs all over the place. The number of them add up to an even number. Okay, but what happens when we differentiate this with respect to the volume? It's gonna be a plus sign. What happens when we differentiate this with respect to the volume? We get volume squared in the denominator. So we're going to get n squared over 2 volume squared and u naught. No, it is not. It's not. <laughs> And uh, right, it's not. You go through it and you check it out. All right, what's n squared over v squared? Rho squared. One half rho squared times u naught. So you see, among other things, we're expanding in powers of the density. When the density is low, when the density is very low, it's linear in the density, the pressure. Right? If, the, if the density is zero, there's no pressure. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. If there's no particles there, there's no pressure. All right? So it's proportional to the density. And it's also proportional to the temperature, because if the temperature is zero, the molecules aren't moving at all, and they don't bounce off the walls at all. So this term is sensible. This term is proportional to rho squared. So when rho is small, this is a lot smaller than this. For, for small rho, rho, if you make rho small enough, this is going to be much smaller than this. And um, that's good, because we're trying to expand in this variable. We, and we expect, what we expect is when the density is low, this is less than this. And it's true, as the density gets smaller and smaller, rho squared over rho goes to zero. Okay. It's proportional to u naught. 
It doesn't seem to care about the temperature, incidentally. It's a term in the pressure that does not depend on the temperature, but it does depend on the energy, on, the, on, the, um, on this one parameter which governs the strength of the, of the interaction, and it's got a rho squared. So that, of course, can be measured. You know, that can be measured. You take the gas and you simply start, uh, you, me you measure its temperature, you measure its pressure, you measure its density, and you change the density. You can keep the temperature fixed by keeping it in equilibrium. You can change the density by changing the volume. All right, so you just start changing the volume. Forget the volume, just keep track of the density, and you calculate the pressure as a function of the density. And in fact, you see that it's not just a linear function, but it starts to increase with a quadratic term. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Uh, initially, you ignored three body problems by yeah. saying that the density is not big enough, but there is no numerical indication. How big may it be before you have to take into account three body problems? The, um, okay, so that, good. If I assume that the energy scale for the three body interactions is about the same as for the two body interactions, um, then the next term would be of order rho cubed here. Three body, to find three bodies at the same place will have a probability proportional to rho cubed. Two bodies at the same place, rho squared. Right. So the next term in the expansion, whether it's coming from three body forces or from anything else uh, which involves three bodies, which will be of order rho cubed, u naught typically squared, divided by the temperature. That's what the next term in this expansion would be. There can be other kinds of, there, there are other kinds of terms also. Let's see. Um, uh, sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. If there are three body forces, and the three body forces have the same order of magnitude as u naught, and this is not u naught here, not u naught squared. It's just u naught. And then, do I have the? T I don't think I have the temperature in the right place. Um, uh, this doesn't look right. Temperature u naught. You know, temperature. There's something wrong with it. I have to think about it. I have to think about it. I'm not sure what the next corrections are. We'll figure them out later. In any case, this is, uh, this is a good approximation for a dilute gas, the first correction to the dilute gas. Could we say that this is the approximation where rho cube is much smaller than rho squared? That's it? Yeah. But you really should co calculate the next term and ask when it's bigger or smaller. OK, so when is it a good approximation to just keep this term? It's a good approximation, the ideal gas, when rho squared u naught is much less than rho times the temperature. Let's divide by rho. In other words, when the temperature is bigger than rho times u naught. Temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of a particle. U naught times rho. What, is the, what are the units of rho, uh, of U naught, remember? And what's the units of rho? So what's the units of U naught times rho? Energy. So we're comparing energy on the left with energy on the right. Let's see. Uh, look over here. Rho times u naught is basically the potential energy per particle. That's what it is. Rho times u naught is the potential energy per particle. 
when the potential energy per particle is much less than the kinetic energy, then it's a good approximation. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're really um, studying the gas in the range where the potential energy is much smaller than the kinetic energy. Okay. So I, I did this mostly to show you how the rules work, to show you that you're not limited to the, um, to the ideal gas, and to show you, could you have guessed this formula? Well, you might have guessed that it's proportional to rho squared because it involves pairs of particles. You might have guessed that it involves the potential energy. It would not have been so obvious that it involves exactly that integral. But it's plausible that a u times a volume is there. Would you have guessed the 1 half? Maybe if you were really, really smart, you might have guessed the 1 half. Um, would you have been sure you were right? Probably not. The mechanical calculation of calculating the partition function uh, that's the ticket. That's the, uh, that's the way to do these things, and that's the way to be sure that you're right. Okay, so we've done a couple of problems. Question? Yeah. Um, so in a, in a typical, like, temperature, pressure, whatever, uh, how big are those numbers, more or less, is it like, uh, you know, rho versus... Uh, U zero compared to temperature in the... You mean like for the get air in the room? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, the temperature is much, much bigger. Very, very much bigger. Look, it's a little exercise to work out. Um, the potential energy between a pair of molecules is roughly... Oh, let's say uh, electron volts or something like that. So you can convert that to whatever units you like. U is of order electron volts. The density of particles is just the number of particles in the room divided by, uh, by, the, uh, by the volume of the room. Uh, oh, you need something else. You need the volume of a molecule. U naught is the energy scale, which is a couple of electron volts times the volume of a molecule or a couple of molecules, a couple of molecular volumes. How big is a molecule? How big is a molecule? 10 to the minus 7 centimeters, something like that. An atom is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. A molecule is 10 to the minus 7 centimeters. So you can take the density the volume of a molecule times the electron volt uh, unit, convert everything to meters and everything else, or whatever unit you like, electron volts is fine, and compare that with a temperature uh, measured in units of energy. You would find that in this room, this is vastly smaller than this you have to start getting into the range where the molecules are sort of almost butting up against each other. It's when they start to, you know, have appreciable probability of being on top of each other that, uh, that uh, this becomes violated. So how much would you have to shrink the room? Uh, I don't know, I have to think about it, but you'd have to shrink it down quite a lot before that became important. Yeah. Um, the, the U zero term, is it possible for that to have either positive or negative sign? Yes. I was just about to talk about that. All right. Okay. So U zero is the potential energy between the pair of molecules. It could look like this. Conceivably, it could look like this. Now, normally it wouldn't, but uh, it could. What does this represent? Does it rep which represents attraction and which represents repulsion? This represents repulsion. The energy goes up as you bring the molecules together. This represents attraction. What would you think offhand would be the effect of repulsive forces on the pressure? Yeah, repulsion between the molecules. Clearly, 
that if the repulsion is really, really strong, and you try to squeeze the molecules to the way they're really saying, I don't want to get close to you, buddy, uh, the, the pressure is going to go up. So when the pressure, when the U0 is positive, that's the repulsive situation, it corresponds to an, an, an extra, extra bit of pressure. So the pressure is stronger if the molecules repel. If the molecules attract, that means that you just uh, choose U0 to be negative. OK, that's, uh, that's the near ideal gas, so the almost ideal gas, so the uh, weakly interacting gas. The other limit, yes? Can you consider actual forces like electrostatic no. propulsion and gravitational yeah. Forget gravitation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to know what the forces between two molecules are, you have to know something about molecular physics. Okay, molecular and atomic physics. Um, they're repulsive on the average. Uh, they are, on the average, they're repulsive. They have a, they tend to look like this. They're repulsive at short distances, and then there's an attractive tail. An attractive tail, and the attractive tail leaks off slowly. But the average tends to be repulsive. The average is repulsive, and so for most molecular situations, this is positive. But uh, we're not doing molecular physics, so I'm not going to tell you how to calculate this. You need a, you need a handbook of uh, physics and chemistry or something. You look it up, and somewhere in there, they would tell you what the, uh, what the potential energy is between a pair of uh, hydrogen uh, molecules, a pair of hydrogen atoms, or a pair of helium. Helium is always a clean, a clean thing, but not reactive. Because it's a dipole. Hmm? Water's a good example because you get dipole forces. Uh, Van der Waals forces are the uh, one over R to the sixth. There's, uh, there's something called a 612 potential that. Uh, uh, one is a 1 over r to the 12th, one is a 1 over r to the 6th. They compete, and they leave something which looks like this. This is not the point, though. The point is, um, uh, given, given the dynamics, given the formula for the energy, how do you proceed? Getting the formula for the energy is not a problem in statistical mechanics. Getting the formula for the potential energy is not a problem in statistical mechanics. It's a problem in quantum mechanics. It's a problem in molecular structure. It's a problem in atomic physics, whatever it happens to be. That's your starting point for thinking about statistical mechanics. OK. That's not subtle. This is, this is very straightforward. As I said, it's blind navigation. Just uh, write down the energy formula. Start doing the integrals. Here and there, of course, there are tricks. But the tricks are tricks of experience. You know, knowing, knowing that I should multiply and divide by the volume to the nth power, that's just a matter of experience. Uh, it doesn't take a hell of a lot of uh, insight. It's blind manipulation of the symbols. Uh, and in that sense, it's... Now, at the end of the calculation, it takes some insight to say, look, am I getting a sensible kind of answer? What does this answer mean? Is it of the right sign? Does it make sense to say that if the forces are repulsive, that it increases the pressure between uh, things? Is it reasonable that it's proportional to rho squared? The factor of a half, well, we know where that came from. We get, it came from the n times n plus 1 over 2. So you might, in, ret in, in hindsight, say, yeah, there should be a 1 half there. You'd overcount if you counted every pair of particles. If you counted 1 and 2, it was different than 2 and 1. And so that's the half. OK. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, why, why is, it we, why is uh, intuitively rho squared the right factor of rho to come in there? You expect one more power of rho 
because this term has to do with the probability that two particles come together. The other term only required one particle. A particle is either there or it's not there. It doesn't matter whether another particle is nearby. So the probability for finding the probability to find a particle in a little volume is proportional to rho. The higher the density, the more likely it is to find a particle in a volume. What's the probability for time finding two particles in a small volume? And it's proportional to rho squared. That's the probability to find one particle. If you only had two particles, if you only had two particles, let's start with one particle. If you only had one particle and the density is rho, what's the probability of finding the particle in a, in a unit volume? It's rho. Right? I mean, uh, uh, it's proportional to rho. What if there are two particles and you, want it, and you want them both to be in the same volume? It's proportional to rho squared. So that's all that's going on. It's, it's uh, straightforward. OK, now something that's much less straightforward. And I remember it really confusing me when I, uh, when I learned thermodynamics. Unfortunately, the professor was more confused than I was and couldn't straighten me out. It had to do with heat and work and something called exact differentials. How many people have, uh, have uh, heard of such things and have been frustrated and, uh, and uh, found themselves uh, wanting to kill uh, the textbook because of uh, exactly that? Only two people. Three, four. Okay, you may want to kill me too. <laughs> Let's take a little mathematical uh, interlude to talk about exact and inexact. Now, exact and inexact in this context has nothing to do with precise versus imprecise. Exact is a technical mathematical term which probably predates um, homology theory and other fancy things like that. It does. But uh, it may have first turned up in thermodynamics. So let's talk about the notion of exact differentials and non-exact differentials and that sort of thing. Take a function of two variables. Here's the two variables. That's the xy plane, x and y. And the function is some, think of it as the altitude, just the altitude as a function of, uh, we'll call it f altitude, f altitude. f is the altitude, and it's a function of x and y. OK, now let's talk about what happens when you move from one point to another. You're taking a little walk in this altitude uh, terrain, in this altitude landscape. And you're taking a little walk, and you take a step, and it corresponds to a dx and a dy. Oh, we, we assume we know the function f of x and y. How much does our altitude change? All right, so our alti altitude changes. df equals partial of f with respect to x. That's the rate of change of f if you moved along the x-axis times the amount that you move in x plus the rate of change of f if you move along the y-axis times dy. You don't have to be moving along the x-axis or the y-axis. You can be moving at an angle. This, nevertheless, is the formula. Okay. And let's write this in the form f sub x dx plus f sub y dy. This is called a differential df. Okay. Is there any restrictions on what f of x and f of y can be in order that this really be the small change in some genuine function. And yes, there are. Basically, one restriction. Take 
the following quantity, d second f by dx by dy. This is the second derivative of f, where you first differentiate with respect to y, and then you differentiate the result with respect to x. It's a theorem of calculus, that, and it's an easy theorem to prove. We won't do it tonight. I'm sure most of you know it, that it doesn't matter in which order you do the derivatives. So that translates into the statement, let's put it over here, the f by dy, that's fy. And now we're differentiating it with respect to x. So that's the derivative with respect to x of fy. That's this term. And on the right-hand side, we have exactly the opposite. We have derivative of fx with respect to y. If I give you an fx and an fy, and I don't tell you anything else except fx and fy, there's clearly no guarantee that this is true. Given any old two functions of x and y, it will not be true that, I'll give you some examples later, and the condition, the condition that fx and fy are really the derivatives of a unique function are exactly this over here. Now, take fx and fy. They form the components of a vector. What is a vector called, incidentally? Gradient. The gradient, the gradient of f. They are the gradient of f. And if these two things are the components of a vector, of a gradient, what is the statement over here? Let's write it this way. This minus this is equal to 0. What's the left-hand side of the equation? Dy, dfy by dx minus dx, fx by dy. It's a curl. It's the curl of f. Or it's, in this case, it's only two-dimensional. If it were three-dimensional, there would be other components of the curl. This is the curl. And given an object, a set of components, two components of a vector, you can ask, are those two components of vector really the gradient of some function? Is there really a function of which fx and fy are the components of the gradient? And the test is this, that the curl should be equal to 0. There's another implication of the curl being equal to 0. I'll tell you what it is. It's intuitively obvious that uh, the following. OK, supposing you take a walk on this terrain and you come back to the same point, how much does f change? Not at all, right? Let's uh, ask a slightly different question. Supposing you take a walk from one point to another, how much does f change? Well, one answer is just the difference of f here and here. But another answer is to add up all of the little incremental changes in f as you move from one point to another. And that is, we'll call that delta f in moving from 1 to 2, is just the integral, just the sum of all the little incremental changes of df, the little change in f, which is fx dx plus fy dy. That integral along this curve here is the change in f. Now, what would happen if you chose another curve and you went from 1 to 2? Would you get the same answer for the change of f? Yeah, because f is just the altitude. And uh, if you go from 1 to 2 on one path or another path, the change in the altitude is the same. Okay. So that says that this line integral doesn't depend on what path you take. Is that true in general for any 
fx and fy, that a path of an integral like this doesn't depend on the path. So let me give you an example of just um, an intuitive example, a sort of silly example, but it's a real example. Uh, you're going to do this operation by driving your car from one point to another along two different trajectories. Okay? And what I'm interested in is not the change in the altitude. I'm interested in the change in the reading of my gas uh, meter. I want to know how much gas I used. All right. So does the change in the gas meter, does the amount of gas that you use, the quantity of gas that's left in the car, that's left in the gas tank, does that depend on the, uh, on the route that you take? Yeah, of course it does. Um, for example, if I take a route from one point to another that keeps you at the same altitude at all times, you'll use a different amount of gas than if you go, if you go from one point to another over a hill. The change in going over the hill will be a larger change in the, in the, change in the gas tank. Uh, another way to say this, incidentally, is that if you go around in a closed loop, starting one place, coming back to the same place, how much does the altitude change? Zero. How about the change in your, um, in your uh, gas tank? Not only does it depend on how you go, but it certainly won't come back to the same value afterwards. <laughs> nevertheless, nevertheless, the change in your fuel, now F stands for fuel, the change in the fuel can be written in this form. How much fuel you use to go a little x distance, and then how much fuel you use to go a little y distance on this terrain. The change in the fuel can also be written as a differential. But it's not the differential of some function. If it was the differential of a well-defined function, if you go around in a loop, the change has to be 0. It's quite clear that if we're talking about uh, the, uh, um, another example could be how tired are you, uh, are you if, after going around. Let's make the, uh, the approximation for simplicity that you don't get tired at all if you don't, uh, if you don't change altitude. All right, uh, walking, sliding along uh, a uh, frictionless uh, surface or something, no, uh, no effort. What about uh, climbing over a hill and coming back to the same place? Well, if you got untired by going down the hill, then maybe you could say that your tiredness ratio wouldn't change. But that's not true. You get plenty tired going downhill. So whatever these Fs are, they are such that if you go around in a closed loop, you do get a change. There is a complete mathematical equivalence to the question of whether line integrals around closed paths give zero and whether the curl of the function is equal to zero. They're the same mathematical statement. The curl has to do with going around a little loop. Going around a little loop and asking how much things change is the curl itself. Going around a big loop is the line integral. So the main point is not every pair of functions fx and fy define in this way. They can always they define a differential, but that differential is not necessarily the differential of a function. So let me give you some examples, two examples specifically. Two very simple examples. Oh, incidentally, when this is true, the vector field f, or the fx and fy, are called exact. When it's not true, they're called inexact. Exact here does not refer to accuracy. It refers to whether the curl of the vector field is 0. Yeah? The problem I had had was that I was told, on the one hand, that it applied, uh, that, it, um, that, that it, uh, it, applied, it applied the exact, uh, exactness condition applied to a system when it was a conservative system, 
but no mathematical statement was given for what the conservative system was. So I just didn't understand Conservative systems have to do with forces. If fx and fy correspond to the force field, then um, exactness corresponds to uh, conservation of energy. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about mathematical um, properties. I'm just saying that when I raised my hand, I didn't have any trouble with the math part here. I know. I understand. Right. But not everybody is familiar with the concept, so I want to go through it, uh, the mathematics of it. Yeah. Is this, is this somehow related with, to the curvature of, again, if you look at uh, x as a vector and y as a vector, the cross product is a tensor and the dot product has to be zero or something? It has a great deal to do with curvature. Um, for example, on a curvature of a surface, going around the curve may change angles. But, but I, I don't want to go there now. It has a great deal to do with curvature. But, um, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Some DFs are differentials of functions. Others are just random expressions involving small changes of things that you carry with you. You know, how about the gas fuel, the, the, the gas in the car is a well-defined quantity. It's a well-defined quantity. It just doesn't depend on x and y. You can go from one x to another. You can go from one x to. You can go from one point to another, in two different routes, and change the amount of gas in two different ways. So the gas in the car is a thing you carry with you along a path, and it definitely has a definite meaning along the path. It's just not a function of where you are. It's a function of the whole path of how you got there. Inexact differentials usually have to do with things, changes that uh, depend not only on the endpoints of a trajectory, but depend on the whole trajectory, like getting tired or the amount of fuel in your gas tank. OK. So. We now know what exact and inexact means. Let's give some examples. How about trying f sub x is equal to y, and f sub y is equal to x. The test for exactness is, exa is, is this. All right, so let's calculate dfx by dy. What is that? 1. How about dfy by dx? 1. Is this exact? Yes, this is exact. And it must mean that fx and fy are derivatives of some function. Can you guess what function fx and fy are the gradients of? xy. Take the function f equals xy. Its derivative with respect to x is y. Its derivative with respect to y is x. Okay, So this is really the gradient of some function. What about this one here? fx is equal to y. fy is equal to minus x. This is a possible rule for how the change in your gas tank might work. If you take a little, this is a perfectly good rule about uh, small differentials of the amount of gas in your car, but it does not define a function. Right. How do I know that? Because in this case, the fx by dy is 1, but the fy by dx is equal to well, right here, 1. I mean, 1. Minus 1 now. When I wrote 0 here, I meant, to, I meant, uh, I meant that the difference between them was 0. Excuse me. The, the derivatives were the same the first time, now they're not the same. This, these are simply not the derivatives of a real function, of any function. And if I were to take a little excursion, calculating the change of f as I move around according to that df there, as I move from one point to another, 
and I came back to the same point, I would find that f didn't come back to the same value in this case. Now let's talk about heat and work. Heat and work have to do with energy, and they have to do with the changes in energy. So let's define them. We've we're thinking about a gas now. It doesn't have to be a gas. It could be a liquid. It could be anything. But we're thinking about energy, volume, and those kinds of things. Let's imagine, all right, so what, let's take our independent, vari <coughs> independent variables. The system is a box of gas, and it has a, you know, a plunger that allows us to, um, a piston, which allows us to change the volume of the gas. We can push it in, we can push it out. What are the independent variables? There are two independent variables. One can take them to be the temperature and the volume, or you could take them to be the energy of the box and the volume. We'll take them to be the energy and the volume. Energy and volume are our independent variables. Energy and volume. And let's think about the ch Energy and volume? No, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm wrong. Um, what do I want to do? Sorry. Entropy and volume. Entropy and volume. If you know the entropy, any two things will do. Any two things will do. It only depends on two things. It depends, if you like, on the temperature and the volume, but you can substitute, if you like, the entropy and the volume. That's enough to determine the state of the gas, the thermodynamic state of the gas. How much entropy and how much volume completely determines it. Let's think about the energy. Let's take the change in the energy. If we change the volume a little bit without changing the entropy, what's a, what's a process called if you don't change the entropy? Adiabatic, right? All right, so for an adiabatic process, what's the change in the energy? We're changing the volume a little bit. There seems to be a disagreement about the terminology. Quantum physicists mean by adiabatic, slow. Uh, and what I will mean by adiabatic is both slow and no heat exchange, both. In that case, you're right. It's also called reversible. Reversible is another word for, change of for no change of entropy. But in any case, bottom line, if the entropy doesn't change, how does the, how does the energy change? Minus pressure times the volume. That's the change in the energy of the gas if you don't change the entropy. That's what we went through last time. Definition of pressure. It's essentially the definition of pressure. How does the energy change? If you change the volume slowly and without allowing any heat to flow in, reversibly, if you like, with no change of entropy. This is the formula. Okay. Now, what about the change in energy? If you keep the volume fixed, but you add a little bit of heat, I don't know where you got it. You got some energy you, you took from somewhere and you dump it into the system, however you did it. Uh, you could do it by you know, putting a flame under here and heating it a little bit. Then what is the change in, en in energy? In that case, without changing the volume, it's equal to the temperature times the change in the entropy. That is basically a definition of entropy, or temperature, I'm sorry. That's the, change, the definition of temperature. The change of energy is, by definition, the temperature times the change in entropy. Entropy we defined independently. We defined it probabilistically. All right, so these are two statements. Now, supposing you change both the volume and the entropy. This means you do a process. You could think of it as little incremental processes. First, you do um, 
a change of volume, keeping the entropy fixed. Then you change the entropy a little bit, keeping the volume fixed. But at the end of the day, you make a small change of both volume and entropy. And how do you do it? You change the volume a little bit, and you put in a little bit of heat. You do, you do a general process involving both kinds of things. In that case, DE, let's write it over here, DE is equal to minus PDV <coughs> plus TDS. That's called the first law of thermodynamics. And it just expresses energy conservation. Incidentally, who's doing work? This is work. This is work. It's called dW, the work. And this is called dQ. Q stands for heat. Isn't it obvious that Q stands for heat? Don't ask me where the Q came from. I don't know. Qualories or something. I don't know where it came from. Uh, the Q stands for heat, and this is the definition of heat. This is the definition of the heat that you put in TDS. You change the energy by changing the entropy. That's an irreversible change. It could correspond to just dumping some heat in. This corresponds to changing the energy. Who's doing work on whom, incidentally? Is this the work done on the gas, or is this the work done by the gas on the piston? Either. They're equal and opposite, of course. The work done. Hmm? This is the change in the energy of the gas. So this should be thought of as the work done by the piston on the gas. If the pressure is positive, and you change the volume, you lower the energy of the gas. Why? Because you do work on the piston. If the pressure is positive and you push against the piston, you do work on the piston, and therefore you lower the energy of the gas and raise the energy of the piston. All right, so this D work here is the work done on the gas. And this says that the change in energy, this is just definition. This is definition, this is work, and this is heat. The question is whether Q is really a function. Is dQ really an exact differential? Is there such a thing as the heat of a system? Now, the problem is you could go from, what is it? All right, if you know the volume and the entropy, you know everything about the system. Volume and entropy is thermodynamically enough to know everything. It tells you the temperature, it tells you the energy, it tells you everything. Okay. So, you can think of going from one value of volume and entropy to another. Taking a walk on a, on a, in a volume entropy space. The question is whether the heat that you have to put in to go from one point to another depends on the path or doesn't depend on the path. Or another way of saying it is if you go around a closed loop, you put little bits of heat in, you put little bits of work in, you take little bits of work out, you take little bits of, uh, of, uh, of heat out. At the end of the day, if you come back to the same point, is the total amount of heat that you've put in zero, as it would be if the heat were a real function, you came back to the same point, or does it depend on the path, uh, the path that you took? And the answer is it depends on the path, but we're going to prove that. We're going to prove that, uh, that dQ is in not an exact differential, neither is dW. What is true is if you take a system through a cycle or a series of steps and come back to the same state, that the total energy that you put into it is zero. You bring it around and come back to the same point, the energy will be the same, but the heat that you put in or the work that you take out or whatever will depend on the route that you, uh, that you took. Are, are we just assuming that all these paths are, are uh, at equilibrium? Yes, we, could, we do them slowly so that they stay in equilibrium. Yeah. 
that's what we'll do. We'll figure out, we'll use a curl type formulation to check and we'll see what the, uh, it's, it's not too hard. It's, it's actually just one or two steps. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just write, let's, let's write this, oh, okay, leave it as it is, TDS. Let's write, remember our independent variables are entropy and volume. So let's write now that um, uh, what do we want to write? Let me, let me get my notes. Yeah. Here it is. DQ. That's this term. <coughs> that's this term over here is equal to DE minus or plus PDV. Okay. I'm going to change the independent variables from S and V to energy and volume. Energy and volume. Do I have this right? energy and volume. However I move from one point to another, dq will be equal to the change in energy plus the pressure times the change in volume. Okay, so now let's write. Let's assume that q is a real function, that it's an exact differential. First of all, this would say that dq by dE is equal to 1. You would read off here that the Q by DE, the change in Q, if you change the energy keeping the volume fixed, is equal to 1. That's one thing that this tells you. Another thing that it tells you is that the change in Q, when you change the volume keeping the energy fixed, is the pressure. That's what it would say if there really was a function q that this was the derivative of. Is it true? How can we test out whether there really is a function that satisfies this? We test the curl. This is dq by dE. Let's differentiate it with respect to volume. What do we get? All right. So we get on the left-hand side, d second q by dE by d volume, so d volume, is equal to zero. Now let's differentiate the right-hand side with respect to energy. What do we get? We get the derivative of the pressure with respect to the energy. If there really was a function q, in other words, a function that, uh, that didn't depend on how you move from one path to another, it would have to say that dp by the energy would be equal to zero. That's the curl test. Differentiate this one with respect to volume, that gives you zero. Differentiate this one with respect to energy, this would give you the pressure by the energy. Will you believe that if you have a box of gas, and you change the energy in the box of gas that the pressure doesn't change? No, of course it does. But let's check it for an ideal gas. Let's check it for an ideal gas. We've done the calculation for an ideal gas. The pressure of an ideal gas PV, uh, PV, yes, is equal to, <laughs> PV equals NT. So P equals P over V, right? Okay, leave it that way. That's one equation. Good. And another equation I want is that the energy is equal to three halves n t. n t is equal to two-thirds e. This says that n 
t is equal to two-thirds e. So we can write that this is equal to two-thirds e over volume. Do I have that right? E over volume. Pressure is two-thirds E over volume. Okay, now we come back to this side over here, and we ask, when you change the pressure, when you change the energy, does the pressure change? At fixed volume. At fixed volume, and the answer is yes. At fixed volume, if you change the energy, the pressure changes. So it is simply not true that the P by dE is simply not equal to zero, not equal to zero. The, te the curl test has failed. I'm getting tired, but the curl test has failed, indicating that there's no such thing as Q being a function of where you are, of what the state of the system is. It depends on how you move from one place to another. In other words, um, the amount of heat that you have to put into a system in order to change it from one state to another state depends on the path that you take. That's why heat is not a good um, description. How much heat you put into the system is not a good description of the state of the system. It's as good as asking how tired you are and whether that determines your altitude. Right. No. How tired you are depends on how you went uh, from one point to another, and not just a change in altitude. So heat is like that. Heat is like that, and work is like that. Only the combination of the two of them uh, is really a function of the state of the system. Function of the state of the system means a function of the temperature and volume, or energy and volume. Okay, I'm um, getting a little tired. Is there any uh, questions uh, left? This is very subtle stuff. It's very tricky. I know everybody has, or well, many people have seen it and been confused by it. Uh, you're probably still a little bit confused by it. But why should you be? Why should it be the case that the, that the heat that you have to put in versus the work to get from one place to another should not depend on how you get there, how you go there. Okay, I'm tired. Uh, we've had enough. But, uh, it's, right. the efficiency of an engine, right? it's related to the efficiency of an engine. Yes, right, right. So, right, exactly. So, um, what's that? It's connected with all of these things. It's connected with things like hysteresis. Um, uh, memory in systems, but here it's just a statement that uh, heat is not a uh, function of the properties of, it's not a property of a system. Heat is not a property of a system. Now, you know, your state of tiredness is a property of you, but it's not a property of the landscape. Not a property of where you are in the XY plane. It's not a property of the landscape. Your state of tiredness depends on how you went uh, from one X to another X. Same with heat, same with, uh, all right, enough of that. Enough of that, we're finished with it. We won't have to, no more heat. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.